quindi questo è il quinto appuntamento uh, qui da, da GAD nella questa serie di incontri che Uh, abbiamo realizzato con una serie di ospiti intorno al, um, al progetto di Marcus Heinsdorf, un artista tedesco, che, artista e architetto, che oggi mostra qui da noi a GAD, uh, con un progetto, The Space We Live In, che esplora le possibilità dell'abitare uh, diciamo dal punto di vista del, del mondo globalizzato quindi posto globale e un mondo diciamo, nella, in tutta questa serie di cambiamenti che stiamo vivendo da, tra cambiamenti climatici, migrazioni, eccetera. Eh, un progetto che esplora possibilità dell'abitare anche ispirate all'architettura vernacolare, a possibilità di eh, architetture alternative fatte con materiali di recupero. Insomma, abbiamo affrontato una serie di, di discorsi nei, negli incontri eh, che hanno preceduto questo eh, legati a a questi temi, soprattutto focalizzandoci poi sul concetto della coesistenza, che è poi effettivamente eh, il concetto intorno a cui ruota la biennale di quest'anno. Eh, oggi abbiamo il piacere, ho il piacere di, uh, di, di presentare il progetto di Elena Biatici uh, che, uh, che è stato possibile appunto grazie al sostegno dell'Italian um, Council uh, e che è un progetto appunto che esplora, come poi ci spiegherà anche lei in dettaglio, uh, le questioni invece connesse piuttosto all anche all'inquinamento se vogliamo, in particolare all'inquinamento alfattivo Uh, e a problematiche legate quindi a, diciamo, a, ai sensi, quindi, uh, quindi all'abitare uh, in connessione appunto al nostro, al nostro sentire. Um, forse è il caso di fare anche un'introduzione in inglese per uh, appunto gli ospiti internazionali che abbiamo e che ci seguiranno. So, um, he hello everybody, I'm very happy that we are here today, thank you for joining us. Uh, so this is the, the fifth um, meeting uh, that we have here in GAD around the, the project uh, of uh, Marcus Eindor. And, so um, uh, and uh, so during this, these days we, um, we uh, touch several different issues connected with uh, uh, the, the living and in particular with uh, the uh, question of living in this post-globalized time. So um, between several issues that we, um, uh, that we raised, there were of course the, uh, the question of the Uh, how to um, how to share this space and how to uh, reinvent um, our way of living. Um, so today I'm honored to uh, introduce you the project of uh, Elena Abiatici uh, that was realized in collaboration with the Italian Council and um, the project of Elena is exploring Uh, the topic of the coexistence and uh, living together as well uh, from the point of view of our senses so how we can uh, feel as well uh, we can uh, uh, so how this how our senses like our smell for example can influence our way uh, of uh, living in a specific space so um, so I'm, I'm going to leave um, To leave you here um, and so that Elena can introduce all, all, um, all our guests today and can explain further uh, the project that she uh, she's she's doing so thank you again for being here thank you for your patience and so thanks Caterina hey, Valentina pardon Um, and I'm really honored to have you here and uh, that you have been accepting uh, my invitation. Uh, this is the first uh, appointment regarding uh, my project. Uh, the title of the project is The Eternal Body, Human Senses as a Laboratory of Power Between uh, uh, Ecological Crisis and Transhumanism. Uh, so I can give you a briefly introduction of the project. Um, uh, the, the idea started uh, uh, last year um, 
thanks also to COVID-19 because uh, uh, the tension that COVID uh, um, put on our senses uh, was um, very important and was very relevant. Um, COVID uh, um, also causes phenomenon of anosmia as a phenomenon when uh, we don't perceive any smell. Uh, parosmia, when we perceive a smell for another one or phantosmia, uh, we perceive a smell in absence of it. Uh, so uh, the idea started last year and uh, was uh, like uh, um, an idea that uh, encapsulating uh, my interest in, my interest uh, uh, towards senses um, because it's um, uh, almost 20, 10 years that I'm uh, uh, trying to research uh, about uh, uh, this topic. Um, the uh, olfactory pollution is one uh, uh, pollution that uh, normally uh, we tend to uh, forget. Um, it's something that uh, is not so much uh, um, uh, that has not uh, has not a, a real impact uh, on our life, so uh, we try to um, avoid uh, or uh, try to uh, forget about uh, it, uh, as if uh, it is something that um, uh, could not have a real impact in our life. Uh, instead, alteration of hearing and olfaction and olfaction due to environmental causes are very frequent uh, um, and uh, represent also an alteration of our uh, um, mental health um, because uh, um, sorry in, of interruption um, alzheimer for example the diagnosis of alzheimer and uh, of parkinson begins with the loss of the sense of smell and uh, every day we are surrounded by different uh, uh, volatile compounds um, that are carried out by wind and are carried out by the dust uh, uh, that are um, present in the material of our normal life, for example, in the material that we use in architecture and in design. Um, but uh, we are uh, not uh, aware of the damage that this kind of uh, um, uh, organic compounds can give to our life. Uh, so this is uh, one of the, we can say, we can say this is uh, the reason why I want to um, uh, study and to research uh, about uh, this topic. Uh, uh, another one was the, um, the, the regulation of uh, this kind of uh, pollution. Uh, in fact, the international uh, uh, regulatory framework regarding the noises and uh, uh, smell is one of the most regulated, um, even because uh, the intensity of uh, uh, odors and noises are very subjective. Um, uh, there is a, a last, um, one of the last, um, uh, I can say, point that uh, I would love to uh, present to you. Uh, that is uh, the, the fact that in our life uh, uh, and also the digital revolution can uh, describe and uh, well um, demonstrate it. Uh, is that uh, we um, we hope for the immortality you know, uh, of our body uh, every um, every year and every time uh, medicine research something uh, to make our life longer. Um, the paradox uh, uh, of our our society that uh, is that we refuse no natural uh, in a sense natural life, so we refuse the natural smell like uh, uh, smell of our blood, uh, smell of sweat, and the body odors uh, in, a, in a world. And instead, we normally and silently uh, accept uh, the odors produced by the amount of waste and the amount of uh, um, car or industrial uh, smokes. Uh, so in the middle of this uh, uh, artificial humanism, where the 
uh, digital revolution, the artificial intelligence uh, start to uh, inhabit uh, um, all the points of vulnerability you know, of human beings. Um, there is uh, a coexistence that is very uh, a strange, a coexistence of uh, what is not anymore uh, um, natural and uh, what is uh, uh, always and more and more uh, uh, artificial. Uh, um, this is uh, a framework of my research and uh, uh, obviously um, uh, being a researcher in a contemporary art, um, I, uh, I try to uh, focus my uh, interests on uh, how architects, architectures, uh, but not only uh, as in this um, talk, uh, we will have the honor to have also a physician, um, uh, Roberto Palesse, and uh, a chemist, Corrado Natale. Uh, so um, the research is uh, uh, like a connection between uh, um, um, obviously uh, science and art. And uh, we will uh, uh, begin the talk with uh, Peter de Cupera, that is an artist. Um, uh, Peter de Cupere is an artist that we can say an olfactory artist. Uh, uh, he says that smell is and gives the context of his work. He's been researching for 20 years how smell impacts our daily life, uh, how um, our urban environment smells, and also um, uh, how smells uh, differ from one culture to another. Uh, in uh, this talk, we will uh, uh, we have selected uh, some works more related uh, to uh, polluted hair in urban context, and I would love to uh, introduce Peter to pass the mic to Peter to Peter, uh, asking him uh, how did you develop this idea, uh, and how did you develop your project uh, from the idea to the complete. Uh, uh, realization and also uh, to um, show us uh, um, how did you start also to get interested in the smell. All right. So uh, thank you, uh, Ela Elena, for the nice introduction and also the invitation to participate in this beautiful lecture. Uh, I'm going to share my screen first. So, uh, so I see that. So, uh, it worked before, but now it looks like Ok, um, ci sono dei problemi uh, con la connessione di uh, Peter, De Cupere. Uh, uh, scusate, un attimo che cerchiamo di risolvere questo problema. Vi spiego un attimo in italiano quello che eh, ho detto prima per gli ospiti in italiano, mentre uh, cerchiamo di mh, mh, riconnetterci con uh, Peter. Uh, dunque, eh, in realtà questo è il primo appuntamento di una, di una serie di appuntamenti che verranno fatti legati alla, alla ricerca che sto facendo rispetto all'inquinamento olfattivo e rispetto all'inquinamento eh, acustico, che sono due tipi di inquinamenti fra i più deregolamentati, anche per, uh, per l'impossibilità di... Uh, eh, regolamentare appunto oh, qualcosa che come gli odori e i uh, suoni sono abbastanza di percezione, sono soggetti ad una percezione soggettiva. Uh, in realtà le um, alterazioni dell'udito e del, uh, dell'olfatto in questo talk ci uh, focalizzeremo più che altro sul, uh, sull'olfatto, um, sono mh, 
diciamo molto visibili in casi di, uh, in, e lo sono stati anche uh, durante il uh, Covid, che ha manifestato problemi di anosmia, di parosmia o di uh, fantosmia. Uh, di fatto sono delle alterazioni che uh, portano all'assenza di uh, percezione degli odori o alla uh, percezione di odori diversi da quelli reali o ancora la percezione di odori anche in assenza di uh, questi. Um, alcuni artisti e architetti, come vedremo uh, oggi, hanno elaborato e rielaborato uh, in modo uh, completamente personale il paradosso della contemporaneità, che è quello di aver uh, tentato di abbandonare quello che è l'odore naturale, l'odore uh, del, del corpo, l'odore della morte, l'odore del sangue, soprattutto a partire dalla società industriale, e di aver accettato in modo uh, silente mh, invece quello che è proprio definito l'inquinamento uh, olfattivo è un inquinamento in quanto tale perché uh, provoca forme di uh, uh, depressione, forme di uh, ansia e crea una vera e propria alterazione del nostro sistema nervoso sia centrale che uh, periferico. Ehm, uno del, degli aspetti che è trasversali rispetto alla ricerca è mh, il tentativo di comprendere anche come l'abuso e il controllo dei nostri uh, sensi in, uh, nella, nella società insomma, uh, contemporanea, eh, in realtà in questo momento sono immersa nel, nella confusione più totale dell'inaugurazione uh, uh, dell della Biennale, quindi mm, è molto evidente insomma, anche quello di cui uh, stiamo parlando. Um, come di fatto questi uh, due tipi insomma, di uh, inquinamenti mm, Uh, hanno provocato poi un, um, un abbassamento anche delle potenzialità dei nostri sensi e sembrano aprirci anche ad una uh, possibilità di sostituire uh, i nostri sensi e la nostra percezione attraverso uh, degli organi artificiali uh, o, o uh, presunti tale. E Peter in questo momento ancora forse sta aspettando che lo rimetta. No. E forse abbiamo il dialogo con Peter in questo momento. Right. Um, so, I'm creating art with scent and with smells, sometimes disgusting smells, like the smell of air pollution, actually. So, I created, for example, smoke cloud. It's a cloud where you can put your head in the cloud. So, it's a big cloud and you can go on the stairs and then you put your head in the cloud. Once you go with your head in the cloud, you start to smell the air pollution from outside. So, when it's showed inside the museum, uh, You have the context of a clean space and you don't expect it there. So, and everyone wants actually to put their head in the cloud because it's, yeah, first of all, they like to take a picture, to put it on Instagram, most of them, because it's a beautiful shot. It's kind of poetic effect. But once you put your head in inside, you want to go out again. So you're confronted with him. Another work is uh, Smoke Flowers, which I showed during an exhibition, Command Al Alternate uh, Escape, in the, uh, the last Biennale in 2017, during the openings week. And that were flowers, real flowers. You must imagine walking in a park at uh, Arsenale Nord. And uh, uh, so, so, and at one moment, you see some flowers emitting smoke, real smoke coming out of the flowers. So it's crazy to see. So and you go to there because you're curious. And then you smell the air pollution. It's actually nature that's taking revenge at that moment. So the nature is really emitting this, the air pollution. And uh, what, because we are. Uh, destroying nature with polluting the air. So now the nature was uh, taking revenge of it. Technically, it was very difficult to make because it's with micro chirurgy, uh, uh, tubes, very thin tubes to get uh, the smoke uh, inside the flowers. And the flowers kept on living. So it was very, really, very, really, very thin and did a lot of research about that. So uh, other work related to it, you could say, are the pollinators. The pollinators is a work that are bees. I have, um, that we know, honeybees, but uh, I give them a little mask. So the idea is that bees uh, cannot find one day, there, there are less bees going in the world. So, so it's also more difficult for them to fertilize uh, uh, flowers, plants. So, and they are really necessary to survive also for us as humans in the future. We, um, it's, it's one, one Uh, an important part in, in, in the evolution of, uh, of uh, uh, life, you could say. So the bees have little uh, masks and they, they, they are mentioned to, in one way you could say, to uh, uh, clean the air. 
but you can also see it like a kind of a helping element, maybe to help to find the way back to the, the flowers. Um, I also created a garbage city holiday park. It's a, it's a park where you can go on holiday, but instead enjoying nature, you're gonna enjoy garbage. So you have to be there, you have to clean garbage by yourself and you make buildings with it. So it are real houses, bi huge buildings. For example, I made one uh, a paper house, uh, existing house over 120 tons of paper, uh, or an Ecolo, black Ecolo uh, um, tents. Um, so uh, you, you have to imagine more than uh, around 900 uh, uh, plastic uh, garbage bags putting together to build an Ecolo where you can go and sleep inside. Or uh, uh, a tent that's made from uh, 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 yeah, garbage, leftover uh, papers, plastic, or um, a kind of uh, oil barrels that are putting together where you have to sleep, sleep inside. But the, the nicest thing about this is that inside it smells nice. So you have to clean first the garbage and then uh, put everything together. And then uh, inside you can spray a nice perfume. So you're sleeping in a very beautiful environment that you could say that when you close your eyes, but when you open them, you see the garbage. Uh, An other work that's uh, a nature cleaner, where I kind of vacuum clean the trees. But on a location, it was in Belgium in 2004, where I was vacuum cleaning the trees, where three highways were coming together. And in the middle, I was just cleaning the trees with a vacuum cleaner and spraying under their armpits some uh, 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 fresh uh, pine air, you could say, some synthetic perfume, you could say. In one way, it's also not natural, but the, the, the cars were also destroying them. So it's kind of, um, it has actually not really a function what it was doing, but it was also to give a comment on these things. Other project I did, for example, also in Italy was uh, driving with a car that was covered totally with earth outside and inside. So, uh, and at the top, there was uh, uh, some grass and plants standing there. So you bring nature, in the city, you drive with your car totally covered with art. And uh, uh, so, uh, which I have a lot of works related to, to air pollution. So looking at my uh, presentation, what else I want to do? Oh yes, uh, Centeno 2. That's, um, uh, you must imagine a fuel station that you see at a, a highway, at the site when you want to take some fuel for your cars. But it's a fake one. It's totally made, it looks out of uh, concrete, but it's fake concrete. And you can not take fuel, but you can take sand. So you, you take it out and you can smell it. And there are three fragrances. One is a smell, I actually five. One is smell of nature. Well, one was a smell of grass from the field was behind or the smell of lavender. The second was a smell of uh, bubble gum. And there was also, of course, the scent of air pollution. So it depends from which one you were taking. You also... Uh walk for a city with a smell stick. I was very impressed by uh, that, uh, that project. It was a project I did in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, uh, yeah, it was a blind smell stick, you could say, and there we could never find people. I also walked by myself through the city and filmed it. Uh, so you cannot see anything, just by smelling, you try to find your way. Uh, even with, without the smell, it would be very difficult, but, but uh, the smell is a little bit more easier, you could say, but also this, this, this uh, yeah, more confronting. But the idea is, imagine that you're gonna perfume the streets and then you can find your way by just by smelling. So you walk in the city, you blind smell it and you find your way. It was a project I was intended to do for uh, only for blind people, but it came also in exhibitions and uh, got an own life talking about blind people. Uh, actually today there was an opening in Bruges in Belgium where I created the alphabet. It's the first uh, scent alphabet. So people can smell uh, text by, yeah, reading text by smelling just. So it's, uh, but that I will post some later on my Facebook. Uh, it's just uh, starting today. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting, um, really. Uh, which kind of smell did you try to perceive, bad or good? Uh, uh, because uh, uh, yeah, through a city, it's very difficult not to imagine uh, a good smell, uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, except uh, the, the, the smell of food or the smell of flowers. Uh, 
because I saw some images, no, and uh, uh, you perceive the smell of garbage, the, the sense of smoke, the sense of dust, the sense, uh, yeah, of dust, smoke, so it's it's, uh, uh, type. Of, it's 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 actually when you walk in the city with these nice smells, it's disgusting. Actually, you could say the streets are yeah. really disgusting when you walk there. So you have to put your mind on zero and just say, I just try to experience it, find my way through it. So, but sometimes one moment you just get a nice, beautiful scent. I must say about the blind smells, there are little mm -hmm. ventilators and they don't take the dust with it. So it's designed inside, it doesn't take the dust, only take the smell. There's a little heater also in it to heat uh, the fragrance a, a little bit uh, so that it's uh, easier to, to perceive it when it comes to your nose. So it's actually a blind smell stick. It's a stick that's connected with your nose so you can uh, walk on and find your way. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's the author of numerous design and architectural projects. Her main topics are the relationships between senses, time, spaces, and design. And uh, uh, she develops uh, these kind of relationships and uh, topics uh, in education, conferences, publication. Uh, um, she's the co-author of a marvelous book and a very relevant book with Anthony Perlis. Uh, invisible architectures experiences places through the senses of smell and also media under uh, um, publication as uh, uh, senses time and architecture published by post media books in 2012 and other main publication um, one of the topics that uh, i was very mm, interested in uh, reading uh, uh, her book was the relation uh, between smell and death, smell and time. Uh, in particular, I was very impressed by the, the, the chapter when uh, she describes uh, the relevance for the Egyptian, for the Egyptian uh, um, uh, society, civilization of their factory system. Uh, because the Egyptian believed no, that in the nose of the human being, there was like a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was very curious, the presence of uh, a researcher, Schwaller, that for uh, almost 12 years, uh, he studied the temple of Luxor. Um, and he um, arrived to define the, this kind of temple as the architectural representation of the olfactory system. Um, and this represents the, the importance that the Egyptian uh, gave to death and uh, the importance that uh, of the um, of a death that have to be accompanied by the factory dimension. No, um, uh, instead our death uh, and in particular in the last year uh, is very um, clear. Uh, that is something uh, that has not uh, not only um, sanitarized uh, and that is not only became clinical but his. Something uh, that has to be um, as far as possible uh, uh, from uh, uh, the life of other humans. Uh, so it's something that uh, um, emotionally and physically uh, is uh, uh, far away from our life. But, uh, and instead, there is this kind of um, uh, industrial uh, smokes, uh, this kind of uh, uh, dust that. Uh, um, Cover our covers our our life, um, and I want to introduce to everyone uh, the, the uh, presentation of Anna Barbara Anna Barbara um, on dust on the architecture of dust. We can say mm. um, I, I as as you said I'm an architect. And I start uh, working and researching on olfactive, uh, uh, let's say, in 2006. And at that time, very few people were working on that, except for perfumers and chemis uh, chemistries. And, um, and I was very attracted on the fact that uh, um, to the olfactory system uh, uh, were related all our taboo. And taboo was uh, about sex, body, food, religions, death, as you said. And all the places related to these taboos were also related to uh, olfactive qualities. 
and I started to work on that. And uh, I and uh, let's say I, I I wrote a book. I did researches, and in 2014, so very recently, there was the first Nobel to research in olfactory. And so it's a very new discipline related to design and architecture. No? I think that uh, there is a lot of opportunity also for the young students. I'm launching now a master in olfactive design, also because uh, um, not not because of the COVID, but the pandemic, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> affected uh, this uh, sensitivity. But there is a lot of work how to design uh, not the perfumes, how to design the air in the spaces where we live. And uh, this is very, very important because uh, sometimes students, they focus on designing furniture and designing, I don't know, uh, wallpapers and uh, visible things, but the invisible qualities of the spaces are very strong and strongly related to our neurostimulus and the culture and uh, beliefs. So uh, very interested on the on the topic you just touched about some pathologies related to olfactive. For instance, people people uh, people believe that uh, Alzheimer is related to the loss of the olfaction. Uh, one year ago, together with uh, another colleague, Francesca Ripamonti, we have been called for working in uh, an Alzheimer hospital and the, the therapists were asked if there were some possibility to improve to train the olfactive system and we discovered the reading the let's say uh, scientific literature that uh, indeed they do not uh, lose their olfactive system they lose the connection between the sense of smell and uh, the mm -hmm. um, the cognitive part of the um, the brain so they cannot recognize they don't know what it is mm -hmm. but if they like it they 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 smile this is interesting because if they like it coffee mm -hmm. if you give them uh, the stimulation the stimulus of a coffee they smile so it means that there is a deep memory related to the olfactive uh, that uh, we need absolutely to train and their training, we, de we designed for them an olfactorium that was dedicated to, to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you can you can go and I say something just for not occupy too much space, according to the other. Uh, another important uh, um, information is that, for instance, the historian Josef, Josef Rickwert, uh, um, he was teaching the history of architecture to his student, and he was used to ask them what the Greeks were doing in the building, what was happening, for instance, on the altar. Uh, this, wo uh, this was where cows, bulls, and other animals were slaughtered in sacrifice, so there was blood and stench. So we never think as architects, as designers, and sometimes as artists too, how much olfactive sensations are important part of our consciousness and experiences of the place. Uh, it's 80 times stronger the memory of a, a perfume than one image. So um, as you said before, order of death is certainly the most tangible perception of the entropy and time. But uh, this is why we move the death from our lives. We hospitalized the death, no? as Michel Foucault was saying in, clearly in his books. And the death is smell of formal data, as uh, in the Damien Hirsch uh, uh, cows. Uh, yes. You can go can you see the, the image? Yes, yes. Can you yes. see the image? The, okay. Yes. The next uh, is uh, uh, a work by Christina Morbi. She's uh, an artist in London. She's a designer. And it's interesting because uh, it explains very clearly Death is the transition by the composing material in form of gas. No? What is interesting is that we have two molecules. One is putrescine and one is cadaverine. And both of them are responsible for the smell of rotting flesh 
that represent the, the, the composition of organic materials. By the way, the same molecules are part of the order of the semen. So we could declare that on the olfactive experience, death and conception, birth, are closely, closely linked in a continuum. So um, you can go next. Uh, then I arrived working on researching on dust because dust carries the, the odor of passing time and of the material. No, uh, we have the volatile uh, compounds. Dust is a trace, uh, and uh, the fact that dust is a trace is a sentence by a book of Elio Grazioli, it's an amazing book about uh, the dust in art. Mm? Uh, and then we can, you can go next. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, Marcel Proust, no? uh, where uh, he was uh, uh, reminding uh, through the Madeleine how smell is related to, to places, to bodies, uh, to the proximity. Mm? Okay, and you can go next. Uh, uh, sorry, I cannot see. No, you can go. Okay, this is Proust. Then you can go next. And uh, we could say that the that's the breathing, uh, that uh, is the beginning of the relationship between art and contemporary, um, dust and contemporary art. Dust the breathing, breathing has a very nice story because uh, uh, Marcel, Marcel Duchamp who was in New York and Man Ray entered in his uh, atelier and he took a picture of uh, the, an art piece that was called the large glass. So on one year of, uh, uh, one year of dust, and he took the picture and uh, taken with a two hour long exposure and he captured the complex texture and diversity of material over, over uh, the, the, of the top of the surface of glasses. And uh, this uh, picture was so strong for Duchamp when he came back that he cleaned up, he whipped the, the, the surfaces, but then he kept a small cone of the dust uh, included into the into the art piece, and uh, if you go next, uh, for instance, also next slide, uh, there is uh, Joseph oh. Boy's uh, performance where he considered the sweeping the dust as a sculptural gesture, political gesture. Working with dust, he's shaping the world and giving form. In a, for, in a sort of counteraction to the entropy. Hmm? Uh, next uh, slide is dedicated to Clay Ketter. Clay Ketter is a photographer, an artist uh, who, uh, again, tried to fix through dust and the powder the sense uh, of uh, uh, time, briefing it. Go next, there is Marta Clark and uh, his series of uh, an architectural still related to abandon and time uh, and how we can brief uh, the, uh, the material of time. Or next, uh, there is uh, Paul Aselton, that uh, uh, next, uh, next slide, the dust of everyday life, that is another installation and uh, the handful of dust okay. that is a recent exhibition. Okay. Uh, just to go very quickly to the end, uh, we have uh, what we call uh, the volatile organic compounds. And we brief, we brief the materials through the organic and inorganic compounds. So this is very important because uh, dust and uh, these elements are in everything, in panels, in wasserie, in paperboards, in wallpaper, in fabric, in curtain, in furniture, in carpets. So we brief the uh, the space, no? And uh, this is very strongly, especially now after pandemic, we will be very sensitive to the quality of the air we breathe. Uh, if you go next, uh, there is a, a picture I really love that is the movie Wall E, uh, where it shows this dusty world uh, that it reminds us uh, the inform architecture by Georges Bataille, you know, the dust revolution. This could be the projection in, in the future. 
but just uh, going back one second, there is another book that I love, that is uh, the book of Beatrice Colomina, X-Ray Architecture. You can go next. No. Sorry, next. She wrote uh, this book named X-Ray Architecture, going through the 20th century, precisely the phobia of dust and dirt and their potential harmful effect on health. And uh, so it's true, the 20th century was, uh, let's say, phobic uh, against uh, the dust. And the smell was measuring uh, uh, the, the quality of the air. So all the material inside the architecture were amazingly dry. We couldn't breathe anything. And then if you go next, uh, there are two images that I like very much because uh, is when the 20th century emancipated itself from the presence of dust, then we have two, uh, two images very strong that brought dust back into the collective imagination that one is the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the other one is the collapse of the Twin Towers, as uh, Belpoliti wrote uh, in his book. And uh, the last few images, uh, the last two images, if you can show, one is uh, Jeff Koons. Uh, Jeff Koons uh, with the installation uh, New Hoover Convertible, uh, he's representing this dust phobia because uh, in fact, uh, he also installed his works into glass boxes with the light in to be sure that we have a sort of medical uh, uh, package of the art piece. Uh, we, he's uh, uh, placing the Hoover, that is something to absorb the dust, to clean from the dust inside a glass box. So uh, the dream to live in absolutely new space without any dust to be brief. And the last image is, uh, uh, and I close with this image of the dust of which each of us tries to make uh, an, a projection, the red dust of Mars to read signs of life, traces of what could become uh, eventually our possible future. So what I'm saying is that uh, at the end, the brief in the dust, uh, we can uh, understand uh, how uh, is our relationship uh, with, uh, with, with the air, with the smell that is not necessarily an uh, simplified uh, smelling fine fragrances but we smell the other humans, the materials, and so on. Yes. So okay. thanks, Anna Barbara. It was very inspiring, uh, your uh, uh, presentation and the many, the many stimulus that uh, uh, gave to us. But, uh, in particular, I was very attracted uh, by the, these last images that you presented also because uh, um, it's something that is very connected uh, with uh, the next guest. Uh, in part, the, the, the image of the, the, the end of the century, you know, the, the wall of, uh, uh, of Berlin and the uh, Twin Towers. Uh, Peter Lang is uh, an architect and uh, um, I... Hi, Peter. Hello, hello. Okay. Hello, hello. Uh, Peter Lang is an architect that uh, um, launched the initiative uh, Marvels and Catastrophes. So this is something uh, uh, very clear, the image that I'm still uh, showing, uh, very representative no, of this topic, Marvels and Catastrophe, that is something uh, really connected to every kind of explosion no, uh, that uh, um, behind the dust create this sensation uh, uh, like uh, the artificial uh, and digital uh, world that we are living in. Mm. Peter Lang is an architect that uh, uh, works so much on the Italian radical movement and the um, architectural radical uh, um, uh, movement. Uh, really, he launched it only in 2018 uh, uh, Marvels and Catastrophes. 
uh, working uh, uh, with uh, uh, artists, uh, designers, architecture, and uh, critical uh, uh, thinkers. Um, I think that today um, is uh, good uh, in uh, our um, situation. If uh, Peter can uh, show us how, starting from the 70s, we um, can say, yeah, the 70s, um, our daily space uh, spaces um, started to put our senses uh, in the spotlight and uh, also um, how there is this uh, um, con constant, flu constant fluctuation between uh, utopia and the limits of wonder and catastrophe. And uh, if you have also or some uh, artistic, architectural, maybe dystopian project that uh, have accompanied the entry into a reality that is uh, both technical uh, and uh, uh, both polluted you know, and overstimulated um, in uh, the perception of the world. Well, uh, thanks, Elena, um, and also thanks to, uh, to your guests. Uh, it's, it's nice to see Anna, Barbara, and uh, uh, listen to you guys. I um, I mentioned that I was going to talk a little bit, just briefly go over something, which I think also Anna Barbara is, is touching upon with the artists, is um, you know how uh, the senses uh, it came into uh, you know. Um, uh, our culture in this in the post-war period through um, uh, architectural investigations and um, the, the one of the things that I was very fascinated by with the Italian radical design movement was um, how the Italian radical designers were so interested in um, the five senses so what I did was I looked at the five senses in, in terms of uh, architectural construction. And, um, and what I noticed was in the early 60s and 70s, architects still were able to uh, understand the whole environment, uh, which we, we will call environmental design through um, the things that they were doing to the environment. So to give you an example, if I go through the five, uh, five senses, um, sound or hearing, um, of course, is is uh, a particularly important in in early the post-war architecture with audio systems. So the um, architects began to be very concerned with how you could either isolate sound to make sure that there was enough sound barrier to keep places quiet. The windows would have sound. Um, uh, uh, you know, double pane, etc., and also sound systems. There were many houses that I visited designed in the 1960s and 70s, which had a central sound um, audio systems, which meant that there were speakers in every room in the house. And then you would be able with one stereo system and phonograph, you could play music in all the rooms. Uh, which is something today we would find very easy to do with Bluetooth. But back then it was a big wiring job, right? It was crazy. And the same would be, um, yeah, it was you know, the beginning. yeah, it was the beginning. And, and for me, touch uh, is, is, can be translated into materials. So architects in the post-war period were very interested in uh, understanding how uh, materiality uh, affected the design of the space. And so they would be introducing different kinds of, um, you know, hard materials, soft materials, cold materials, warm materials into the house in order to change the environment. Um, and, and that was quite interesting. So touch becomes a way of manipulation of, of the, of another sensory state. Then, um, the, the other, uh, sense is sight. Um, which um, I, I understood to be um, like uh, light. So uh, again, um, 50s and 60s modern architects were very concerned with light um, uh, entering into the house. 
They were very concerned with, for example, natural light and artificial light. So this is where you began to see architects very concerned about, uh, uh, you know, reflecting light so you would not have direct light into your house, uh, the use of skylights, and also there the a very new science of lighting was coming into the house. So you had different kinds of lighting systems, which again would be centralized. So you could turn on the entire house, you could turn on bits of the house, et cetera, et cetera. So light is also a very important uh, factor. And then uh, the, 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 I mean, I have two more. One of them, of course, is smell. Um, to, for me, I interpret smell through the, this period, the 60s and 70s, as um, air, air uh, manipulation or air conditioning. So you have passive air where you have passive heat and air systems that are designed to heat or to cool the house. And then you have mechanical um, air systems which are designed to heat or cool the house. These are called the HVAC systems. Um, and so there is, again, the architect is, is concerned with how natural air circulates through the house and how the house stays fresh or, you know, to the extent that you guys are interested in smell. And finally, taste, which was one of my uh, favorite because um, taste is what you call uh, uh, in Italian, you use the word gusto, um, but in English it's taste, and um, in Spanish you say uh, me gusta, and it's the highest level of um, uh, admiration. If I walk into a house and I say, this house has very good taste, then it means that you are in a fine house, and so if you, the same in Italian or other languages, uh, Gusta means that it, it is it is the best. It is it has a good taste. It is a you know grande gusta, etc. So this these were the five senses. And when you look at the 60s and 70s architecture um, uh, developments, you see uh, you hear about uh, this term environmental design, which comes out of a cybernetic uh, sources cybernetic research that was coming out of either the Ulm School in um, post-war Germany, uh, the HFG, uh, or other, other uh, schools were experimenting with uh, environmental design ideas, and they were environmental, so you have everything. And I look at that like a spaceship. So uh, a spaceship or a uh, space suit has to, has to have all five senses. It has to have air. It has to have. Um, it has to have light. It has to have um, uh, a, a pretty much, um, you know, sound systems, etc. So these are full packages. And in the in the sixties and seventies, the idea of environmental design became very big. So Berkeley begins to call its school of architecture the environmental design school. Uh, I was teaching in a in a Texas in an environmental design school. Uh, and it was not yet the environmental design of sustainable design, but many architects who worked in environmental design did work on sustainable design. So that's, I would stop there on, on that point. Thanks, Peter, for uh, this uh, development uh, uh, of the uh, radical architecture. And uh, I... I was very interested in uh, your presentation because I think that uh, uh, there is this kind of um, uh, beginning, you know, uh, since the 70s uh, on um, uh, the over pollution, over pollution and the over stimulation of our senses that uh, are uh, um, something uh, put in the spotlight, you no, know, starting from the 70s in our daily space, in our uh, houses. And this is interesting also what uh, you said about uh, the uh, space shuttle, you no, know, because uh, um, uh, the next guest, uh, Roberto Paules, uh, is a professor of uh, uh, physics, no, uh, of chemical uh, science, pardon, and Corrado Di Natale is a professor of uh, uh, electronic engineer uh, in. Uh, at, Tor Vergata uh, University send uh, 
um, her um, artificial olfactory system that is a nose, uh, electronic nose, uh, in the space. So the space uh, that surrounds us is one of the most polluted, uh, seems to be, and uh, it is one of the most polluted area in the universe. Uh, so welcome, Corrado Di Natale and Professor uh, Roberto Paoles. Now I pass the mic to you. Okay. <clears throat> I move you, Peter. Okay. Uh... Uh, only an introduction, a brief introduction, uh, maybe that could be uh, useful. Um, the electronic nose is not something that uh, we ca can replace uh, uh, our nose, that maybe uh, some people could, uh, could think could think about, but there is an uh, olfactory uh, artificial systems uh, able to uh, test uh, uh, all full, uh, all full uh, compounds in our hair, and also is able, sorry for the, um, there is a strong sound, um, is able to uh identify markers also of lung cancer uh, so it's uh, it is used in medical uh, um, in medical uh, uh, site and also in uh, um, um, you can say uh, physician one yes um it is called the artificial olfactory system but uh, we have to understand that uh, it does not uh, replicate the uh, what the human nose perceives. So it is different. It is based on a different kind of sensor. And uh, it is important also to consider that uh, humans, we have been able to make, uh, let, let's say, vision or sound uh, re replica of vision or hearing without knowing how vision and hearing work in, bi in biology. With olfaction, this is not possible because uh, the, the way olfaction works uh, is uh, intrinsically connected with its properties. And uh, at this moment, uh, we have just a, a very pale, uh, let's say, knowledge about how the entire olfaction, the sense of olfaction works. And what we do with the electronic noses, with the artificial sensor, is try to mimic the overall strategy of this uh, of this sense because uh, what is very uh, let's say interesting is that our olfaction is very plastic so in sense that that uh, human eyes uh, is the re result of the evolution and they have this a uh, very narrow bandwidth which is uh, focused at, uh, at 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 seeing the sunlight so very, we have been, let's say, developed these, uh, these organs just to see the sunlight, it, which is a very narrow bandwidth in the, electro, in the, in the electromagnetic uh, ra radiation. But with olfaction, we can smell molecules that never existed before. So we can synthesize a new molecule and our olfaction can sense it. This is amazing. Because uh, it means that, that these uh, sensors are very broad. Let's say you can sense uh, a very large a vastity of different uh, molecules. This makes it very, very complicated to replicate this system. And second, our perception, our reaction to molecules is very different. Even if molecules are subtly different, uh, the, the colleague before shown uh, uh, spermidine and cadaverine and say they look similar but actually for our olfaction they are extremely different even if uh, their chemical similarity is very very strong so to make artificially this property is absolutely let's say i want to i do not say impossible because uh, uh, it's my job but uh, it's uh, it's very it's very it's very difficult so uh, this, I, we have to consider this fact if I can add something, Corrado, I have yes. to say that uh, there is also the problem that usually the odor is not just one single molecule because we are in an environment where the, there are a, a huge number of different molecules. And usually the per our perception in the mix of substances are not the simple sum of the different substances. 
but the mix make a completely different perception for us. For, so this is, uh, uh, I would say, multiplication of the difficulty by the, the perception of the replication of the, uh, of the olfaction. And we have to say that, that nature uh, understood this problem because uh, there is, for example, for uh, the olfactory receptor, a completely different approach. For example, in uh, our body, there are enzymes that are very selective. They should react with a single species and transform these species. When the selectivity is lost, it's dramatic because we are poisoned. With olfaction, nature has a, the opposite approach, a combinatorial approach. They uh, leave the selectivity to go to the broad uh, complementary uh, approach. Sorry for the interruption, Corrado. Oh, it's, it's okay. And because this is just what we did, so try to replicate this system. So to make artificial sensors that can have, that can, let's say, behave similarly, not the same way, similarly because odor is the human perception of the chemistry. So, and the, our sensors are artificial. So it's, it's an alien nose, you know, it's, a, something, it's, something, it's something different. And these uh, resulted in instruments and these instruments have been applied uh, as uh, has been said before, for instance, in the space uh, to measure uh, the, the changes of the composition of air. What the electronic nose does very well is to measure variations. To, to compare and to see these two odors are different, as to measure when an odor changes, when the composition of the air changes. And uh, this can be applied uh, to medical di diagnosis and to many, to many different, uh, to many different fields. But uh, what is interesting is that we can just uh, copy the strategy of nature to make artificial instruments. And uh, in some in some cases, uh, the instrument that gives, uh, let's say, result gives the signals that can be compared with those of humans. For instance, we have with, it, but also other colleagues, many, uh, there are many examples of, uh, uh, let's say, comparison between uh, uh, sensor signals and panels, panels of uh, tasters of, uh, let's say, the people, let's say, uh, uh, that, uh, um, uh, uh, use uh, work with the wines or with the food uh, in general. And uh, you can just make a comparison and to see how can we predict the human perception from uh, the, uh, the signals of the sensors. But uh, in, general, in, in general, these two systems are different, artificial and natural. Um, uh, there is a thing that the things that uh, uh, once uh, you told me about the receptor no, and the molecules. Uh, uh, so um, our noses, uh, our olfactory system has uh, a number of receptors that service many, many uh, molecules. No, so many molecules are uh, coded or decoded, we can say, by uh, a few uh, types of receptor, no? Is it right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Also to, yeah. And, and this is the uh, way how also the electronic nose works, no? They try to, um, we can say, reproduce, no? The human olfactory system, system obviously, uh, <laughs> with difference. Just to say the similarity about uh, about the artificial, the natural olfaction, it's just on the on the receptor. So uh, we have we use the a, a natural uh, kind of compounds, the porphyrins that we have in our blood, because the, this kind of uh, molecules are able to uh, bind uh, by different mechanism a, a huge number of. Uh, uh, of different species, but with different uh, sensitivity. So in practice, we can realize the receptors that, that are able to interact with the different uh, uh, species like the receptor, but in a different way. And then there is uh, data analysis that is uh, in charge to extract the information, the chemical information in something that is uh, can be represented just to discriminate uh, uh, the different chemicals that we mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, 
But these are the more or less the uh, the overlaps among the two systems about the approach. But the how this uh, realizes from the the natural is much more complex, not completely understood now to respect our our system. For example, our sensor works in the solid state while our receptor are in a water environment. So there is a, a complicated mechanism of proteins that should transport the, the volatile compound, which usually are lipophilic to the receptor. So it is uh, quite complicated. But do you think that in a future, human uh, senses could be replaced by artificial uh, sensorial system, I can say, uh, or okay. so that in the future uh, everyone uh, uh, could uh, self monitor I monitoring our a, health with some uh, instrument. That... I, I hear, let's say, not continue. Okay, uh, I think I think is uh, it will be possible because uh, mm -hmm. um, one of the evidence that 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 we have ah. is that. Most of the properties of, of the uh, olfaction is in the analysis of data, in the signal processing. And this is something that, that we still do not know. The, wh what we are trying to do now is try to replicate the olfactory re receptors, which are just, let's say, the interface between the body and the air. But after that, there is a processing, which is, uh, let's say, mm, mostly unknown and, and very, very, and very, very complex. And uh, we don't know the, what happens there. But uh, what does it seem is that if we provide the signals to this circuit, the, the circuit uh, should be able to decode that. And we know this uh, because uh, even uh, uh, if very simple model of uh, uh, olfactory circuit uh, can be used to pr process artificial signals. So this is a, uh, something, uh, let's say, uh, still not very well known, but uh, uh, the feeling, I, I, I feel that, that most of the properties of olfaction are in the, in the, in the processing, not, uh, not only in the, in the, re, in the re receptor. And uh, um, this gives, okay. let's say, the hope that we could, but of course, there is a, a gap uh, of technology between them. There is a gap of technology. And, uh, are you afraid of it or are you excited Sorry. about it? You Sorry. as a scientific community. Are you afraid of it or are you excited by it? Uh, I mean, as no, a scientific well, we are, community. We are so far that uh, we have no, let's say, thought oh, okay. to, be, to be afraid. But, um, for instance, we know that uh, the human nerves can be connected with artificial system, the prosthetics. No, we can connect human human nerves to artificial uh, to artificial systems. So, in uh, yes. in theory, and uh, this uh, will be will be possible. But uh, you know, we need uh, uh, be, there are millions of receptors in the human nose, and at the moment, uh, each sensor of us has this side. So if you take millions of them, you have you cannot connect them with the human nose, you know. Maybe a Tyrannosaurus can be. You probably a whale, but uh, I don't know. And uh, uh, because uh, there is just a technological gap to be to be to be to be filled, you know. <clears throat> but anyway, in the future, probably. Elena? It's frozen. <laughs> I, I heard something about uh, mice that take, take the sense of mice. Modern with Elena, yes, yes, you're right. You're right. There is people that connect with the, with the, with the uh, natural olfaction. You can put uh, electrodes in the olfactory bulb. And we did the same with the mosquitoes, with the Drosophila melanogaster. Not connection, but imaging. So it is possible. There are, let's say, uh, ge genetic uh, uh, altered uh, 
mosquitoes where you can see the olfactory bulbs when it turns up. And, and you, you, you know, this is very interesting story because we delivered to this uh, m mosquito the odors of uh, cancer cells. And uh, the signals that, that we rec recorded are different for different cancer cells. So the, the, odor, the olfactory receptors of the drosophila can distinguish the cancer cell from a, a non-cancer cell. But this is completely useless for the end for the animal. So we do not know why this happens. And the animal absolutely does not react to cancer or not cancer. You, you know, there is a, a signal existing, but that the brain cancel, the brain cancel this signal. For the animal, this signal, let's say, is just noise or whatever. But that signal exists and we can extract them. So for this reason, I say that the olfactory circuit is very, very important to determine the character, the feature of the of the olfaction. In fact, uh, um, I read about uh, the Tokyo University that tried to use mosquitoes uh, as uh, mm, can you, um, try to use mosquitoes to reproduce uh, the uh, olfactory uh, system by mosquito uh, and to adapt this kind of uh, uh, factory system to the electronic norm. Yeah. So um, yeah. this is very interesting, no? Uh, and very, um, it shows how, uh, in a way, very clear how our factory systems for the electronic nose is only a model, but the model uh, of um, this kind of select, not, not selectivity, um, uh, perception uh, could be found also in other kind of uh, um, species. Um, now, I have really downloaded your presentation. Uh, I don't know if uh, you want. We, uh, we have almost finished our uh, discussion. Uh, if you have, uh, Valentina, some uh, other to say. No, actually, all, right. all the intervention were quite interesting, and um, um, I had an idea, more or less, of, of your intervention, but not, not really. I didn't, I didn't know exactly uh, the course what you were going to say. Um, I also I don't know. We don't hear you. No. So Venice is uh, frozen. <laughs> too many people for the Biennale. It's too crowded, probably. <laughs> yeah, the Wi-Fi is not so. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah, there was a, a, a meme that said, please remember that the Wi-Fi in Venice doesn't work as in other parts in the world in the world yeah. and it's really true yeah, and also google maps <laughs> yes also google maps yeah and then now we are in the middle uh, of installation uh, uh, in gad so uh there are many computers and many people connected uh so i think valentina uh, not only is frozen but uh, has <laughs> lost, <laughs> lost completely uh her connection um i'm very thankful to everyone of you. Uh, really, I'm honored, honored to have the possibility to guest this talk and uh, for the public at home. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoy and you enjoyed and uh, uh, this topic could this topic could be interesting for for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you to every one of us. Okay. Valentina came okay. from here. Right. So, yeah, basically I was just saying that I uh -huh. thank you for, okay. for being here. Thank you, Professor okay. Anna Barbara, um, Corrado di Natale, Paole, um, Roberto Poleste, and Peter Lang, and Peter Tiffperi. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, your, your intervention was really, 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 really interesting. And... Um, <laughs>
a lot um, very diversified compared. I mean, if we, um, because in, in my mind was more oriented um, on architecture and uh, or eventually design. But I really enjoy actually how uh, the, the the conversation finally moved to our rather. Uh, fields um, that are all related by our senses and I don't know if you can see me yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no you can so uh, once again uh, thank you very much for being here uh, for joining us and uh, I really hope that you uh, uh, will come here in Venice uh, see us in God uh, <laughs> so I hope that the next time we can uh, have you here maybe and enjoy uh, conversation in person so yeah. thank you again okay thank you thank you thanks thanks bye bye thank you, yeah. thank you. Nice. 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 Nice.